a spontaneous and unrehearsed interview. Welcome to episode 64 of Curiosityness. I'm Travis DeRose, the host, and you're listening to episode 64 with John Aller. And John is the author of a book called White Shoe. Uh, how a new breed of Wall Street lawyers changed big business and the American century. And it's true. They really did. This is an interesting story that I think most people haven't heard, but it's about the lawyers, the white shoe lawyers behind all the huge businesses of, you know, the 19, like 1890s to 1920-ish era is when they were around. But like, they're the lawyers behind the businesses of U.S. Steel, like oil, tobacco, J.P. Morgan, huge companies that I think most people have a negative perception of. But John tells the full story and admits that they were flawed individuals and human beings potentially, but shares the good that they offered, like uh, helping the New York City transportation system and uh, creating better borrowing and finance. <laughs> finance sorry. And uh, they really did limit their clients, their large companies. They really limited the power that they could have and increase transparency. So in a way, they did some good stuff. So it's an interesting story and something that we're kind of seeing again today with huge Google, Apple, Amazon, all this stuff. So the story is kind of coming back around again. And uh, I think if you just give it a chance, you're really going to enjoy it. So without further ado, here is the episode with John Aller right now. All right. How you doing, John? Good. Good to have you, man. A little hot here in New York. Oh, is it warm right there? Well, humid. Humid. Classic. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty nice here in uh, in Long Beach today and in, in L.A. A little overcast, so I'm, I'm digging it. Yeah. Well, it's usually pretty good there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But you you come to, don't you have a house in uh, California, too? Yeah. Yeah. Northern California. Oh, okay. So you split your time between the two? Yeah. Uh, probably mostly in New York, but maybe a quarter of the time out there. Okay. Man, well, thanks for being on, dude. You, you, the story you sh- you write about is interesting. Something that I've, you know, never really thought about, never really heard about. Um, so let's just start off with tell me a bit about yourself because you've had you're you're pretty qualified to write this book. I'd say you've had a few careers, huh? Yeah, I um, I was a journalism major in college, but then I went to law school. Uh, at Georgetown in D.C., mm-hmm. came to New York, became a, a, I guess you would say, a Wall Street lawyer, and worked on Wall Street as a lawyer for 30 years, um, to representing you know major corporations and the like. And uh, toward the end of my tenure, I started getting back into writing. Mm-hmm. Wrote, wrote and published a book while I was still working, and then I retired from law practice, at least in 2011, and have been um, writing books since. Nice, man. Awesome. So you kind of always had this, uh, you kind of always enjoyed writing? Yes. Yes. I, I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm better at nonfiction than fiction. I've tried fiction, and I'm not, not that adept at it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, cool. Let's just get into this, man. I mean, the story's interesting. Um, so should we start with kind of maybe like what lawyers and law firms kind of looked like before the shift happened in, in like the 1800s? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, let's just imagine you're a, a lawyer in New York City in, let's say, 1876. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of the beginning of the Gilded Age. Okay. They call the Gilded Age. Uh, things like the Statue of Liberty, Brooklyn Bridge, electric lights are all still in the future mm. at that point. Wow. Uh, people are talking about uh, an inner ocean canal somewhere down in South Central America, <laughs> uh, probably Nicaragua, but it's uh. just talk at that point. Uh-huh. So if you're a lawyer in New York, you almost certainly practicing your office is downtown, probably between the Battery and Fulton Street. 
We probably got there by horse-drawn streetcar or maybe the elevated train. There's no subway yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, the practice of law at that point was mostly, you know, you, you were a solo practitioner or maybe had one partner. And you shared office space and expenses, but not legal fees. Oh. You, didn't, you didn't have any associates, what they call today associates, that you paid. Maybe a couple of clerks who were unpaid kind of glorified secretaries who were there to use the desk space at the library, but they were kind of free agents. They, you know, got their own clients. Mm -hmm. Sometimes often they were relatives of, or friends of clients. Uh, They were not there to look for training or education. They they didn't really get any. Uh, They, they learned through observation. So there was no telephone yet. Uh, The typewriter was invented, but wasn't much used. Um, people, lawyers preferred longhand drafting. They yeah. stood, stood at these tall, slanted wooden desks and drafted out the uh, documents. If they needed copies, then the scriveners would um, make copies. The uh, rubber bands and paper clips, they were still a little ways in the future. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe you went to law school, just as likely not. Huh. Uh, the bar exam was oral. There was no written bar exam, and it was very easy to pass. Wow. Uh, you were probably, if you were a lawyer at that time in New York, a generalist. Uh, you did some courtroom work, maybe some commercial law, but what we today would call corporate law as such didn't really exist so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, corporations were not yet uh, capable of owning stocks like individuals, so there were no such thing as holding companies and subsidiaries. Oh. Um, there was no federal income tax, no federal, <laughs> no federal agencies, no federal securities laws. So in sum, in 1876, you may have been a lawyer practicing on or near Wall Street, but mm-hmm. you weren't what we would today call a Wall Street lawyer. Right. Um, most most of the leading lawyers at the time were litigators. They were sort of your order types. Daniel Webster, Abraham Lincoln, you know, out on the prairie, mm-hmm. uh, usually politically connected. Um, so let's flash forward then from 1876, 30 years to 1906. Okay. Which is kind of around the time when my book picks up. Most of what I've talked about now is sort of prologue. Mm-hmm. Um, so 1906, uh, the typewriter is now in full use, rubber bands and paper clips too. <laughs> uh, the telephone is now readily available, though some people are still leery of using it. They think it's not quite professional. Interesting. They'd rather, they'd, they'd rather write a letter and have it delivered by a messenger. Huh. Um, uh, the Panama Canal is now under construction. It's, the, it's through Panama, not Nicaragua. Yep. And, and the New York City subway has opened in 1904. So then also by this time, you have completely new legal regimes and statutes. You have the Interstate Commerce Commission, which came in in 1887. That was the first um, federal agency. You had in 1890 the Sherman Antitrust Act to combat the so-called trusts. Um, Standard Oil and American Tobacco were trusts at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Corporations by this time can own stock, serve as holding companies. And for the first time, you have a federal bankruptcy act. Um, You do, there was a federal income tax that came in, but it was struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. Hmm. They would have to, they would have to pass an amendment uh, in 1913 to allow the federal income tax. Wow. And, and there are still no federal securities laws by 1906. It was pretty much law of the jungle. You sold the stock, you know, you could lie about it, you could uh, pump it up, do anything you wanted with it. Yeah, you could get sued for fraud, but but it was pretty much every man for himself on the stock. Man, wow. So um, I'll just keep going unless you want to ask some questions at this point. No, this is great. Keep keep okay. keep flowing. Okay, so. By around 1906, you now have a what I'll call a in my the title of my book a new breed of Wall Street lawyers. 
uh, the courtroom lawyer as the most sought after kind of lawyer has given way to what I call the conference room or office lawyer. Mm-hmm. And these these are men, and they were all men back then. Um, men of of practical business sense. They were as much businessmen as lawyers. And what they did was they formed and structured the giant new companies that came in around the turn of the century and protected them from government intervention, particularly in the area of antitrust. Uh, They also rehabilitated these companies when they went bust, which they often did in those years, and they used the new federal bankruptcy law to do that. Mm -hmm. These, I would describe these conference room or office lawyers as organization men. They were part of the movement in society from an individualized focus to a bureaucratic and institutional focus, a society run by professional, professional managerial technical class. Sometimes it's been called the search for order and with an emphasis on efficiency and professionalism in modern life. And this was true in the legal profession itself. Uh, it had, was seen in the growth of professional bar associations by 1906. Uh, the licensing and bar admission rules, they're now written bar exams by this time. Mm-hmm. Law, school is, law school is now the dominant background for becoming a lawyer, not clerkships. You now have ethics rules starting to come in and be formalized. And lastly, the whole area of what I call law firm management has now been professionalized and organized. For the law firms themselves are becoming larger, more efficient, and more structured, just like their corporate clients. It's okay. a parallel, par- parallel development. Uh-huh. When, I say, when I say larger, I don't mean, you know, today's mega law firm of 800 lawyers or 2,000 lawyers. I'm talking about, you know, a dozen or 20 lawyers in a firm made it considered to be a law factor. Okay. Um, And that sort of brings us to uh, the first of this new breed of, quote, white shoe Wall Street lawyers I'm going to talk about, and that's Paul Cravath. Mm -hmm. Um, This group that I'm talking about, as as a group, their story has never really been told. You know, most people are familiar with what they call the robber barons, uh, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, mm-hmm. etc. Right. But few, but few people, few know much about the men, particularly the lawyers who advised them. Um, their period of greatest influence uh, as quote white shoe lawyers was during the so-called progressive era, which was roughly 1890 to 1920. Okay. And while while most of these guys were not, quote, progressives, they were key players in the debates of the issues of the day. So, for Bath, um, in 1906, at age 40, he becomes the lead name partner in a, in a firm that had been run by Abraham Lincoln, the Secretary of State uh, Seward. It's called the Seward Firm. He joins that in 1899. Today, it's known as Bath, Swain, and Moore, which is sort of the quintessential Wall Street firm. Uh-huh. Uh, he got his start as a young lawyer just out of law school representing George Westinghouse against Thomas Edison in the battle or the war of currents. Yeah. AC, AC current versus DC current. Westinghouse was AC, and Westinghouse actually won that, mm-hmm. that, uh, that uh, war. Uh, they've actually, there's a, been a fictional book written about it called The Last Days of Night, which is supposedly being turned into a movie with Eddie Redmayne playing Cravath. Oh, okay. Now, the real Cravath was a, didn't look anything like Eddie Redmayne. Was kind of, <laughs> Eddie Redmayne's kind of a skinny guy. Paul Cravath was a physically imposing, six foot four, large frame man, very autocratic personality. Uh, had huge amounts of energy and physical stamina. He was a kindred spirit of Teddy Roosevelt, who was a friend and advisor. Hmm. Um, and Cravath is best known today for what's known as the Cravath system, uh-huh. which is a set of management principles still used by law firms. 
consulting firms, and investment banking houses. Wow. The main elements of that, uh, I remember I told you before about how, you know, there were no associates. You just got some clerks. Well, now it's changed. For Master to change that, he gets his um, assistants direct straight from the best law schools, which were then considered Harvard, Columbia, and Yale. Mm-hmm. Now he pays them. You know, they used to be unpaid. Now he pays them uh, a, a good salary. Yeah. Formally, formally trains them, unlike the old clerks who didn't really expect to. Works them very long hours. Any young lawyer knows that you work very long hours. <laughs> uh, gives them six years, later eight years, to prove themselves. Uh, and then they're, they either make partner or they're kind of expected to leave. It's called the upper out system. Oh. Uh, in the past, whereas the lawyers didn't share legal fees, now they share profits and legal fees and liabilities. Right. They, they cooperate, they work on each other's uh, cases, and they're in, under the crevasse system, no outside businesses are allowed by lawyers. You're supposed to do devote your professional time to being a lawyer, although charitable work, charitable work is allowed or even encouraged. Okay. Uh, um, some other features of the white shoe firms, there was no, back then, no lateral. They didn't bring in lawyers from other firms. They promoted solely from within the ranks. Oh, okay. Um, that has changed today. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did not try to steal the other firm's clients. It was considered ungentlemanly. Um, and, and that also was a notion that kind of persisted for much of the 20th century. That's by the boards too. <laughs> um, is the ne- next lawyer I'll talk about from back then is a guy named William Nelson Cromwell. Mm-hmm. His firm became what's today known as Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, he was a very flamboyant, white haired guy, uh, looked a little bit like Albert Einstein. Uh, a wheeler dealer, a very fast talker, um, invented the holding company as a means of getting around, uh, sort of creating a loophole in the Sherman Antitrust Act. Right. Uh, he was a also known as the, quote, physician of Wall Street because he would rehabilitate companies when they went bankrupt. And what we would call him today would be sort of a turnaround artist. And his greatest turnaround project was the Panama Canal. He was, a, he was the lawyer for some French clients who were trying to get rid of their, the canal and get someone else to build it for a price. And he was largely responsible for getting Congress to switch from Nicaragua to Panama. Oh, wow. He may or may not, depending on how you read it, have sort of fomented the revolution in Panama that led to the U.S. takeover of the canal zone. Mm-hmm. And he was a particularly close advisor of William Howard Taft. Oh. Okay. Then you have Francis Lind Stetson, Frank Stetson, uh, less known today than Cravath or Cromwell, mm-hmm. although his, his firm that evolved from him, Davis, Polk, and Wardwell, is one of the top firms today in New York. He was more reserved than Cravath or Cromwell, but he was just as well known in their day. He was a friend and advisor to Grover Cleveland uh, when Cleveland was president. He was also the, quote, attorney general, they called him, for J.P. Morgan, the great banker. Um, helped form, helped Morgan form U.S. Steel, International Harvester, and some other large companies. Wow. He was highly respected by his peers as a, quote, pure corporate lawyer. Um, and was instrumental in developing the first national ethics code for lawyers. Huh. Um, briefly, I'll briefly touch on a couple other uh, people who may be a little more familiar today, uh, maybe not. L.U. Root and Charles Evans Hughes, both, both are remembered probably more for their government service than as uh, corporate lawyers, though they were that too. Root was the Secretary of War for McKinley uh, and Secretary of War and Secretary of State for for Teddy Roosevelt. He was a U.S. senator and a a major architect of U.S. foreign policy. 
Hughes was became Governor of York. He was later Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He ran for president and lost to Woodrow Wilson in 1916. Um, Brew was a very successful New York City lawyer before and in between his public service. He said he preferred to think of himself not as a corporate lawyer, but as a lawyer with corporate clients. He was very he had a wry, sarcastic sense of humor. <laughs> um, Hughes uh, started his career as a lawyer uh, in the firm, the same firm that Cravath worked, Paul Cravath worked. Um, it was known as the Carter firm, known for Walter Carter. Hughes married the boss's daughter, uh, developed a reputation in private practice, um, and then became elected governor of New York. He remained with the Carter firm, as it was known, uh, off and on over the years, and it, it has evolved into Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed, another well-known current uh, New York law firm. Mm-hmm. Um, the next person, I'll just go through a couple. Okay. Uh, what I'll call the anti-white Jew lawyer, Samuel Untermeyer, was the rare Jewish high-profile Wall Street corporate. Oh. He became, he became a millionaire representing large corporations and trusts early in his career, and then he turned on them with a vengeance to become a populist crusader for business reforms. Um, George Wickersham, uh, as a corporate lawyer, helped form the subway system, New York subway system, mm-hmm. repre- representing August Belmont Jr., the Belmont of Belmont racetrack fame. Uh, Wickersham then switched sides from being a private lawyer to government service, and he served as the attorney general for William Howard Taft. He brought a, a huge number of antitrust suits and won the two biggest ones of the era, the Standard Oil and the tobacco antitrust cases, which broke up both of those companies. Oh. And last guy I'll talk about is John Foster Dulles. He was sort of of the next generation. He succeeded Cromwell as the head of Sullivan and Cromwell. He, um, at age 20, he was sort of a boy wonder. At age 29, he was still an associate at Sullivan and Cromwell, yet he was a lead negotiator and spokesperson for the U.S. delegation to the Versailles Peace Treaty after World War I. He dealt particularly with German reparations. Uh, He was close with Woodrow Wilson early in his career and later became a controversial Secretary of State under Dwight D. Eisenhower, known as a fierce anti-communist. I focused on him because he was the prototype for what I'll call the international business lawyer today. Oh. An adherent of globalism, sort of a pejorative term in some quarters today. Um, In that sense, though, he was in sync with most of his white shoe brethren who were generally internationalists. They supported the U.S. entry into World War I. Mm -hmm. They supported a League of Nations, not the League of Nations sought by Woodrow Wilson, but a League of Nations, and I talk about that a bit in the book. Yeah. Uh, so those are the main characters in in the book. Um, you know, I know there's some people out there who will say, well, why isn't so-and-so lawyer or such-and-such law firm featured in the book? It's not because they weren't important or deserving, but I just decided to pick what I thought were the most influential or interesting lawyers uh, to highlight. Right. Now, um, uh, some people may ask, well, why study these men at all? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're, after all, we're talking about a group of dead, rich, white men, the ultimate representatives of what, you know, in current vernacular might be known as white male privilege. Right. They were, they were mostly wasps. Um, not necessarily all of them individually, but as a group, they were they were somewhat if not overtly anti-Semitic, nativist, um, anti-immigrant, mm-hmm. not especially supportive, of, and some, in some cases aggressively opposed to women's voting rights. Wow. Not, nor were they receptive to taking, taking women and minorities into their ranks, or really much of anybody 
outside the Ivy League world that they inhabited. So some might say, well, the less written about these guys, the better. Or, or as one fairly well-known author and legal historian, who I won't name, said to me at a recent lawyer's cocktail party, good riddance to these people. <laughs> um, but I can think of several reasons to study them. Uh, number one, they may be flawed human beings like all of us, and they had the prejudices of their time, but they did great things. Um, a quote from another legal historian uh, who said that in a Cromwell, a Cravath, or a Stetson, we shall find builders of American society as intellectually bold as a John Marshall, whose molding of constitutional interpretation and whose fashioning of a union are familiar to all of us. Uh, this group really did help create big business in 20th century America. Mm -hmm. They worked hand in glove with their more famous clients like J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller to do that. Now, at least with uh, lawyers, as particularly New York lawyers, uh, this group, they're part of our history, our heritage, where we came from. And I think it's always good to understand your heritage. Yeah. Most, uh, most uh, lawyers who have uh, can recognize themselves as lawyers who began as associates, often in a big firm, and after ma many long hours and many years of hard work, worked their way up to partner, and then cooperated with one another in partnerships of the type that Paul Cravath first developed. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, um, uh, the times that these guys lived in and how they face them may have lessons for us today. Yep. The, the great issues of the progressive era, which I mentioned was, you know, 1890 to 1920, were income inequality, the concentration of wealth in a few people, and what uh, Louis Brandeis, a uh, uh, famous um, Harvard professor, called the curse of bigness especially in the hated trusts and mega corporations of the day. Uh, you had railroads, you had now U.S. Steel. These were, these were new companies, large companies, using new technology. And the technologies that they used did make things more efficient, made consumer goods cheaper. But through their sheer size, these companies left many people feeling that they were being somehow controlled by vast impersonal forces, which kind of has echoes in today's world. Mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in, in where inequality is on the rise, and you have now their big industrial companies, big tech, Google, Facebook, Amazon. Mm -hmm. They are the new U.S. steels and standard oils. Yeah. Uh, and so these lawyers, this group of lawyers I've written about, they were at the forefront of the debate over just how big these great new capitalist enterprises should be allowed to become and remain. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I would say that this unique group of lawyers has a, a, a broader legacy as influential drivers of the liberal democratic order that has prevailed in U.S. society starting around the turn of the last century and really accelerating then after World War II. Uh, they were, you know, they were conservative by instinct, but they were nonetheless, I would say, liberal in the classic sense. They were believers in the rule of law, broad-minded for the most part, despite some blind spots, <laughs> uh, forward-thinking and proponents of gradual progress. Uh, even while they were protecting the status quo, which was their main job for the clients, mm -hmm. they did help steer their clients toward more enlightened corporate behavior. And the most influential of them, their goal was to prevent a revolution from below by the masses by accepting some reforms at the top. Okay. And I'll quote Paul Cravath, who argued for greater transparency in corporate disclosures. He put it this way uh, in a letter in 1908 to his friend Teddy Roosevelt, who was a true progressive. Uh, and they were discussing their support of Charles Evans Hughes, who was running for governor of New York at the time against the more radical populist William Randolph Hearst. 
And here's Cravath writes, he says, the adjustment of the misunderstandings between the rich and poor, which have made Hearstism possible, will, it seems to me, be the important political work for the next few years. He said that we had, he told uh, Roosevelt, we still have the opportunity of working out the adjustment between labor and capital under a conservative administration of public affairs instead of under an administration dominated by the influences which Hearst represents. Huh. And then Kervath went on to sort of chide the very type of men he represented and why they should embrace rather than resist Roosevelt's progressivism as a bulwark against more radical solutions. He wrote, quote, the men who stand for the great corporations and other aggregations of capital will be very dull if they do not soon realize that in national affairs they must look to you for protection against injustice, and in receiving that protection must be content to accept justice uncomplaining. As a lawyer for corporations, I propose to do what I can in the direction of bringing about a change for the better in the attitude of my friends toward the unsolved problems in which they are so deeply connected. Huh, interesting. Now, now, the J.P. Morgans of the world, uh, the businessmen of the time, they would have preferred no rules at all. Right. You no, know, sort of the public be damned. Uh. But their lawyers, lawyers such as Kravath and Stetson, helped them help their clients keep their baser instincts in check. So I would argue, and I have argued in the book, that in the 30 years between 1890 and 1920, the steering of sort of a middle course between totally unchecked capitalism at one end and state socialism at the other end owed much to the elite Wall Street lawyers and their firms. Yeah. So we, so we sort of have them to either thank or blame for the kind of middle ground mixed system of democratic capitalism that we have today. Interesting. And, and so what, you know, while the tradition of incremental progress may be somewhat out of favor today, uh, it's one that I would say is worth recalling um, and studying and perhaps even worthy of some admiration. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so that comes back to the title of the book, which is the story of the white shoe lawyers who helped change big business and the American century. Mm -hmm. so, so now, just real quick. To, yeah, um, go, go ahead. ahead. No, <laughs> okay. Well, just real so quick. That, to, that's kind of my that's kind of my opening spiel. But you know, now I'm happy to take questions on this or that. Yeah. No. That was that was great. That was that was the the lazy man's interview, Paul or John. You just went through that whole thing. That was that was awesome. But um. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting that, you know, the the white shoe lawyers, they they represented these huge companies, but then also were were like, you know, for transparency and and limiting their size and everything like that. Why do you think the lawyers felt that? Was it just was it like a they felt that was the right thing to do or was it something where they felt that's how they could be most successful and strike a middle ground with, you know, the public and everything? I think some of them, um, I, I said most of them were you know, conservative, moderate conservative. Uh -huh. I would say Hughes might have been a moderate liberal, but I think most of them felt it was the right thing to do. Um, they and but I think more importantly, they felt that it was the right thing to do for their clients. So their client, I think they felt that if their clients went off completely half cocked and just bent the rules or broke the rules the way the clients would have liked to, then someone would have come along with more drastic restrictions on corporate behavior, and so. I think they were kind of protective of their clients by reining them in somewhat, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's that's I I think they're you know they, as I said their 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 job was to protect the status quo, but I think they recognized that you had to give a little to accomplish that. Right, makes sense. So uh, yeah, I can understand that. And then so do you do you. Th 
would this would these huge companies like you know JP Morgan and and steel and oil have been built without these lawyers? Do you think it was inevitable or were they really the ones who were the tools that made it happen? Well, it was it was a combination. Obviously, it was the probably the vision for these companies came from the JP Morgans and the John D. Rockefellers, but they had to implement it and execute it in a way that they wouldn't just collapse, particularly under the in the face of the antitrust law. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, 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 and I, there was a huge, probably even more than today, um, distrust and hatred of big corporations. Oh, okay. Then. And, uh, you know, it's only been in the last few years, a couple of years or so, that people have, st- has, have started to turn on Facebook and Google. I would say that, you know, your U.S. Steel and, and the like 100 years ago were pretty unpopular from the start. Mm-hmm. And, and so um, I think that the clients, the businessmen, look to the lawyers for a way to structure these companies in a way that would not run afoul of the antitrust laws. Right. Uh, and, you know, there were, if... I mentioned those two major cases, the uh, Standard Oil and American Tobacco. Those cases were decided in 1911. And what basically the Supreme Court said was, look, um, if you're a huge company, even you know, sort of a monopoly, that's not illegal in and of itself. Okay. Uh, as long as you grow to your size through fair competition, that's okay. Uh, it's only when you use unfair or cutthroat practices to get there that you break the antitrust laws. So if if the Supreme Court had ruled the other way and said, no, you know, once you use a, a certain size, you know, let's say you control more than 50% of the market, um, then you have to be broken up regardless, mm-hmm. then – you know, that would have stopped dead in their tracks. Companies like General Motors or, you know, uh, so many companies that, you know, AT&T, no, AT&T eventually got sued and broken up anyway. But, but, but um, so I think these lawyers, they were instrumental in forging a sort of a compromise which said, you know, a big, just because you're a big company doesn't mean you're necessarily bad. It's mm-hmm. only if you only if you got there through unfair competition. Right. Um, now you know we saw in 20 years ago the government sued Microsoft, saying that they used unfair practices to get to their market dominance, and the government um, won that case, or at least got a settlement that that curbed Microsoft's power. So you can argue whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, but it was really this, that whole body of law in antitrust really developed around these lawyers. Yeah. Wow. So we still kind of see, you know, the, the framework that these lawyers have laid down, we still kind of see that, you know, with Microsoft and even today with, with Google and Amazon and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the points I make in, in the book is that, um, I think people know this. The 1912 election, presidential election, uh, was uh, that we had Woodrow Wilson was the Democrat, um, and he was not the most liberal of of the three candidates. It was a three candidate race. You had mm-hmm. Taft, incumbent President Taft, was the more conservative, but he wasn't really a harsh far right conservative. Um, he was more kind of center right. You had um, Teddy Roosevelt running as the Bull Moose Party candidate, what, the, what was officially called the Progressive Party. He was the most liberal. And then Wilson was sort of in between. But the number one issue, major issue in that campaign was the antitrust laws and the size of companies. And one of the points I make in the book is that's the last presidential election in American history in which, you know, sort of federal antitrust policy was the dominant issue or even a major issue yeah. in, a president, in a presidential campaign. You think back of, you know, the last 
any number of presidential elections, you can't name one where, well, what was the biggest issue in the election? Antitrust. No. <laughs> and, and, but that may, that may be different in the coming, in the 2020 election. I don't think antitrust and Google and, and big tech will be the most important issue, but it might become a significant issue for the first time since that 1912 election. Uh, but you're right. You're right. You picked up on that. That the framework, the legal framework for how you analyze these companies and whether they're legal or illegal, was really set around by let's say by 1914. And, okay. And the basic. I mean, there've been some amendments since, but mm-hmm. but the the basic legal framework is still the same. Right. So. Yeah, so you mentioned like in the upcoming elections, it, it might be something that's important again. It, do you think maybe looking back in, in 20 years or so, we'll kind of see that we're sort of repeating history right now? Yeah, and I, you know, there have been articles um, coming out in the last year or so which talk about big tech and Google and Facebook and do kind of harken back to the early 1900s and say how we're kind of facing the same issues today uh-huh. for the first for the first time in a hundred years. Yeah. Man, that's so interesting. And then so yeah, this is this is a story that's interesting. I've never really heard this before. Um and you're kind of I don't know, I do you do you feel like the general public perception of looking back at this time is kind of a, a negative one on these huge industries and and lawyers helping them? Yeah, I think so. I think the general feeling is, I mean, they, don't, they didn't call them the Robert Barons for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, they, they were, these guys were considered, um, you know, ruthless businessmen. But, you know, you get, you get people now saying the same things about Jeff Bezos and uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so the Mark Zuckerberg is, is really just the John D. Rockefeller of today. So, um, yeah, I, I think there is a tendency to look back and say, this was a horrible period. These were terrible people. Um, but I don't think it's that simple. Right. Well, and that's kind of what you're, the story you're sharing is the, the underlying, you know, good side of what they did with that too, with like, you know, better borrowing and financing and the starting the, tri- like, New York City transportation system and right. everything. Right. I mean, you know, you can debate whether would would we be better off if society today was still what it was in 1880, which was mostly an agrarian society, mostly mom and pop stores, you know, no big box retailers, no Targets, no Home Depots, no you know, no Facebook, no Amazon. Would it be better off if it was all this decentralized, individualized? Um, kind of society, and that was still kind of an open question in the early 1900s as to which way the country was going to go. I mean, there were some people said, you know, in 1910, let's stop this whole growth of industry and go back to the way it used to be, Mm -hmm. you know, farmers and sole proprietors. Um, But I think, you know, at that time, the public, you know, they liked the fact that they could buy, you know, mass-produced automobiles for not that much money. Yeah. So uh, they liked the fact that, you know, they that the telephone system was pretty efficient, uh, even if it was dominated by the Bell system. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, that's kind of the same debate today. Do you, is Facebook, Amazon bad because? You know, it's monopoly, more or less, in, in uh, book selling, at least online book selling. Uh, or is it good because, yeah, you can, get, <laughs> you can get a book pretty cheap, pretty fast, you yeah. know, and pretty, re- pretty reliable. Um, same kind of issues were debated back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting where, you know, we, we love getting pretty much anything we want within two days shipped right to our door, you know. Right, right, right. If you broke it all up and, you know, and then you had to wait five days, would you be, and maybe you saved, you know, 
a buck twenty <laughs> uh, because because there was more competition and no monopoly. Would you be happier or, or not as happy? Yeah. I don't know. I Interesting. Don't know. Interesting stuff. Man, well, John, that was awesome. I appreciate you coming on and telling the whole story. It's it's seems like a complicated issue at first when you you know first diving into it, but I, you do a great job of um, kind of boiling it down. So, you, see, you know, people like me, the average person, can understand this whole story and 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 enjoy it. Well, thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, any other questions you want to go through? Or I just I mean, there's a number of other. I mean, I mentioned four or five guys. There's probably another half dozen that I talk about in the book, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, I stuck in our talk to the main, to the main ones. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that was good. We got a overview and then we'll let people, we'll leave a cliffhanger so people can go buy your book. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of other cases and issues discussed in the book too. It's not all just antitrust, but, but, um, you know, I focused on the, the highlights. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, is there anything else you would like to cover real quickly on the on this podcast? Or? No, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Just, as you say, we'll leave. Don't want to, don't want to spoil everything in the book. Right? Yeah. <laughs> cool. And then speaking of the book, it's uh, White Shoe: How a New Breed of Wall Street Lawyers Changed Big Business and the American Century. Um, available on it's on Amazon, right? Yes. Cool. Bar- uh, and and Barnes and Noble, and it's in most Barnes and Noble stores still. Okay, great. Physically in the stores. Yeah. Cool. So I'll have links to, to the Barnes and Noble, uh, link to the website and to Amazon and then anywhere else we should send people if they're interested in you or, or anything. Else. Uh, well I do. I, I do you have my website. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give people a link to your website. Yeah. 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 Okay. Perfect. Um, and I should say my next book, um, We'll sort of be over this, cover the same time period, roughly 1875, let's say, to 1910. Uh, But it's not about lawyers. It's about cops and robbers in New York City at that time, the policing and the growth of organized crime. Um, And the title of it will be uh, Rogue's Gallery. Oh, cool. Dude, love it, John. You're pumping them out. It's awesome. Okay. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks for being on. Appreciate it. And uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right. Same here. All right. So there you have it. Thanks for listening to episode 64 and sticking around. Hope you really enjoyed that like I did and learned a lot uh, from John. I really appreciate him telling that story. And uh, that was really the, the lazy man's interview. He just told that whole story. So that was great. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, If you want to share this with your friends and family, super appreciate that. It really helps me out in the podcast and and, uh, spreadens it out to other people, if that's a word. Uh, So if you want to do that, do it old-fashioned way. Say it with your mouth to your friends and family, or you can do it electronically over social media. Tag me on Instagram, at CuriosityNessPodcast, at CuriosityNessTV on Instagram. Twitter, and then just at curiosityness at Facebook. I should really try to get those all the same, but that's tricky. You can send me an email to Travis at curiosityness.com. Give me your thoughts, feedback, suggestions for new episodes or to make the sound better or new guests, whatever you want to do. Just say hello. And uh, that's it. Appreciate you listening and joining me on this episode, and I'll see you next time. Bye.